Uh, hey everybody, super glad you're here. Those uh, in the room as well as those online watching the stream of this. Um, excited for a number of different reasons, but mostly because like, this clearly is a topic that you care about and probably is addressing some challenges you all are having and that we've had and that we've sure. learned from and are still having and would love to both share some of what our experiences have been, but also learn from all of you. Uh, but I wanted to start by talking a bit about what my experience at this conference has been like so far. Uh, first of all, it's been my first one in a couple of years. I think you're, yours too. Um, and I've done a lot of walking around, listening to sessions, talking to people, seeing you know what, what's on their mind for a lot of it. And one of the themes that I've really seen throughout this conference has been one of people seeking connectedness. Um, it's obviously a theme, people getting physically together, commenting on how connected they felt, but also, if you look around the conference at all the booths, at all the sessions, there's a big trend on software and uh, processes and tools and others in their ability to help people connect together. And I think that's really terribly exciting. Um, one of the challenges we're all facing around connectedness is one that's been around for a long time, but it's changed over the last couple of years. And so some folks, um, feel connected, they've worked remotely before, they know how to work in that environment, some haven't. But when it comes to DEI, DIB, sense of belonging and all of that, that's always been a challenge. Um, even before the pandemic, even when people were in offices together. And one of the things that's been kind of exciting the last couple of years is how much we've all collectively learned about how to work in an environment and how to create an environment where everybody feels like they belong and have the same access, the same ability to speak the same voice as each other. One of the favorite things I heard throughout this conference, someone came up to our booth and was chatting and they said, one of the really cool things that we've experienced with your product and with uh, some of the other products that, uh, that we use here is that the quiet people now have a voice. And that to me is a super powerful statement and something that we can really affect positively as people in this industry and people that work in teams. And so, Hey, we're going to talk about some of the challenges everybody's faced, some of the things we've done to address those challenges. We'd love to hear from you on this topic. And it's really exciting because you're here. This conversation is happening. I know these conversations are happening in all your teams. And I think as a collective, we have a lot to learn from each other and a lot that we can share with each other. And in doing so, we're becoming more connected. And we are having the right conversations to take our teams to a spot where everybody feels included, everybody feels like they have a voice, and that we can take those quiet voices and turn them into powerful voices that can have an impact. So with that, I want to introduce uh, my friend here, Jason Giles, and why don't you tell a bit about yourself, Thanks who you are. Me. There we are. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure being here. My name is Jason Giles. Um, I'm Vice President of uh, Product Design at User Testing. Uh, if you're not familiar with User Testing, it's a, it's a leader in video-based insight. Um, it's a platform that allows you to get feedback from your customers. And that's feedback of an idea you might have. Uh, it could be an interaction with your product, maybe your brand messaging. And because it's asynchronous, and it doesn't matter where they are in the world, you can get this feedback really quickly and get these perspectives from customers, prospects, whoever it is, um, on, your, on your ideas and on the products that, that, you're, that you're building. Um, I have a team of about 30. Uh, we're spread across uh, the US, Canada, and the UK. And uh, you know we've got uh, designers, writers, and researchers all working together with our product teams to try and make our products useful, usable, and, and delightful. Awesome. And uh, I'm Kirby Fruget. Uh, I am the SVP of engineering at Mural. And if you're not familiar with Mural, we're a collaborative intelligence company. And what we really care about is this kind of connectedness and how we can help teams collaborate, how we can go from ideation through innovation and enable and foster a culture of teamwork and a culture where everyone has a voice, everyone is part of that collaboration, and everybody can effectively work together to do great things, affect positive business outcomes. So. Um, kind of circling back to this intro, Jason, uh, a lot of this topic, like you generated this idea, and I'm really curious, like, why is this so important to you? Um, you kind of touched on it. I mean, I think the, the pandemic has forced uh, new ways of working and all sorts of really uh, interesting challenges. And um, as part of that, we've learned so much, and we've grown, and we've experimented, and we've failed, and we've tried a lot of different things. And as we consider 
uh, whether it's moving back into the office or hybrid environments, how do we not lose some of those things that we've, that we've learned um, in becoming a more uh, equitable workplace and getting more of those voices uh, into the, the way that we work? Mm -hmm. And what, what did your environment look like before the pandemic? Like, how did things work? What was your experience like there? Uh, you know, to set some context, I think user testing was about 300 folks. Uh, we were remote friendly, so we about a third of the company uh, did work remotely. Mm -hmm. um, but still, you know, I would say we're based in the, the San Francisco Bay Area. There was still that culture of, like, there being, there being a, uh, a kind of a central headquarter. Mm -hmm. Uh, space there. We were private at the time, um, and uh, since that time, we've grown dramatically. We're at 800 now. We've subsequently gone public, um, and then we really had to think around um, how we're going to accommodate collaboration in, the, in this new environment. Um, yeah, the, a lot of change. Yeah, right. A lot of things going on at the, at the same time, and I think that's been one of the, you know, from a. a an exciting thing of if you love problems, there's no shortage of problems to solve. And so uh, it's been a really interesting uh, time to apply ourselves uh, mm -hmm. to how do, we, how do we move forward with all, this, all the changes going on. Mm -hmm. Totally, and very, very similar with Mural. We've grown really rapidly in the last couple of years. Uh, a couple of years ago, a vast majority, so I'm in engineering, a vast majority of our team was in Argentina, and we've grown really worldwide. And you know, we have a product that is a tool that affects positive collaboration, but even with that, it's challenging, right? It's hard to figure out how to work together in an all remote world um, and help people feel like they're part of a team when they might be thousands of miles away from each other. And so um, we've really been focusing heavily on this. I'm a, a studier of people. I think you would describe mm -hmm. yourself the same way. Totally. And this has mm -hmm. been, to me, a really fun time to kind of observe and see what works and experiment. One of our values is experiment like an owner, and we take that you know, pretty seriously. We try stuff, and we see if it works, and we measure it, and then we see what else might work, and we just kind of keep mm -hmm. iterating on that and really trying to create a great experience for the people on our teams, not just for our customers. So, yeah. um, so like digging in a little bit more, let's talk about some of the challenges. So can, can you share some more of some of the challenges you've had as you've gone from that small San Francisco-based company to worldwide remote? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there's two aspects on the, on the geographic side. The, one of the benefits is that because we're now our hiring uh, really takes doesn't take location as much mm -hmm. into consideration. We've been able to add so much uh, diversity to the team, whether mm -hmm. it's regional diversity or the backgrounds, and really finding this amazing talent pool that's spread out across the, uh, the world at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so that's awesome. However, it in introduces a bunch of new challenges, right? Um, the actual time for there to be overlap between uh, the time zones mm -hmm. uh, is, is greatly limited now. Uh, we call it the, gold, the golden hour. Mm -hmm. And so it's forced us to be a lot more purposeful about the time that we use and the way that we use, we use that time. So I think that's been certainly a, a, big, a big challenge. On the remote side, um, I think you kind of touched on this when you mentioned about those quiet voices. Um, in a completely remote environment, I think it's been uh, a challenge to ensure that we create ways for folks to still participate in the conversation. Um, I know, I'm sure the, the, the engineering team's the same, but in design, uh, design critique is, is critical. These, these candid conversations about putting ideas out there and then tearing them apart. And uh, that's great for us who are like verbal thinkers. Mm -hmm. You know, we have no hesitancy to like speak up and hey, wait a minute, I've, I've got something to say here. But for those that don't, uh, don't that's not their orientation where they like to listen first, they like to understand, collect their thoughts. Um, if we were only forcing folks to do that in that kind of synchronous environment, um, it's, it's, a real, it's a real challenge. And this is where some of the tools that uh, we'll talk about more really mm -hmm. come into play. So, Have, I'm assuming you've experienced similar things. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, that difference in collaboration style, the difference in culture. You know, we've talked a lot about trust underlying how people connect and how people work together, and that's a that's a difficult thing to build um, as teams, especially as you're scaling and growing out a team. And so, um, I'm curious, like, what ways have you found to collaborate different working styles, people with different backgrounds, diverse teams? Like, what have you done in terms of helping 
um, really accommodate different, different styles and people with different backgrounds. Yeah, I, I mean, I think at first it's an, an acknowledgement of that we have all this diversity. Mm -hmm. We've got different learning and communication styles. Um, what can we do that's purposeful about that? What can we design into that? And so uh, in our synchronous uh, settings, one, we, we've gotten a lot more disciplined, right? Frankly, in the, the old days, it was like, let's get everybody together. Who's got something they want to share? And we all kind of pile on. That, that's not fair anymore, right? When you got folks in different, uh, um, different regions uh, or folks that want to come in prepared so that they can get their thoughts. So now simple things like we leverage confluence for agendas and we've got a very structured um, way to, be, to kind of frame the discussion. You know, here's the problem that we're trying to solve. Here's the state of the, the, um, the, the design. Um, this is the type of feedback that we want. And just building some of these templates that ensure that every uh, discussion has that kind of structure. The other piece is that we've introduced formal roles like moderators and note takers. And the moderator role is critical because it's not just about keeping us on task. Um, it's a rotating role, so everybody uh, kind of plays that role, you know, depending on what the meeting is or uh, on a rotation. But it's also about listening and paying attention to who is participating and purposely providing opportunities. You know, I'll, like I said, I'm a verbal thinker, so I'm the first one to kind of jump in. Um, but it's great for you know, our junior writer to be like, sorry, Jason, you already talked. I'd love to hear from Lily over here. Um, and so just that, that kind of mindfulness in those synchronous environments. But then we've got these new tools. So whether it's, uh, you know, we use Mural a ton for brainstorming and collaboration. Um, we also have design tools. The one that we use is called Figma that is kind of optimized for collaboration. We actually insert those into the, the, the synchronous meetings where uh, we'll give the kind of framing and then we step back and we do heads down time. And where you can have your writers and your PMs and researchers drop into the files, you know, they've got the context now, they're learning about, they're reviewing the content that's inside, and then uh, we come back together as a group, and then they're much more better prepared to be able to articulate their thoughts, and, you know, uh, similar to the comment that you received in talking to some of the attendees here, we are hearing voices that we haven't heard before, mm -hmm. and I think that uh, that's just, it's making the product better, and it's making our, uh, the solutions that we're providing um, much more equitable to the customers because we've got so many more perspectives and they're looking at things from a lot of different angles. I'd love to hear how you're, uh, how you're doing similar things at, at Mural. Yeah, it's really exciting. Um, yeah, we um, shout out to Liz, our accessibility uh, tech lead on, on our team. She gave me some of the things that her team does with respect to this. And so one of the things they focused on pretty heavily is different mean, mediums of communication for different people. So uh, they'll do written communication, they'll have murals, they'll do loom videos, they'll do just all sorts of, just of stack other. it on because certain people consume information in different ways. And recognizing that that's the case and being very intentional and deliberate not only makes for better communication, but it also makes people feel like these people around me care about me and that I belong here and that just little gestures go a really long ways for helping people feel like they're part of the team. Um, also, kind of within our product, so we, we use our product heavily internally, um, and we have this feature we call private mode, where it's very similar kind of how, to how you described it, where people go away, but it's all together. And mm -hmm. so you can enter private mode, and people can put their feedback in place, and they can see that activity is happening, but they don't know who's writing what, they don't, like, you, you can't see the work of the people around you until you do a reveal on that. And one of the things that's really powerful about that is, yeah, the people who are a little nervous, maybe they're feeling imposter syndrome, maybe they're new to a team and haven't really onboarded onto that team, so they're like nervous to put themselves out there in some way, mm -hmm. feel much more comfortable doing so. And we find that, that ways like that where, again, you're kind of like creating an environment in which people can, can succeed in that, no matter you know, what background or their meth means of communication or how nervous or how new or how whatever, it, it, it's that intent that goes a really long ways on that. Um, and so it, it makes me think we, you know, 
combining these tools gets really powerful. Right? 100%. We, we, use, uh, we use Slack mm -hmm. communications and uh, uh, a Loom, which is a video capture uh, technology. And uh, one of the things that we did is we set up, um, you know, every week, everybody on the team gets a reminder that's like, set up 30 minutes to give feedback on someone else's project. Mm. It's the work in progress. And so what they can do is the individual then, uh, on their own time, when it works for them, they can go in, they've, they've gone in, and they go into the work in progress Slack channel. And what they'll find there is they'll find a Loom video that gives context. Here's the problem I'm working on. Here's the problem I'm trying to solve. You know, here's maybe some technical limitations. Um, and then here's a link to the actual design file in this case, or a research study, or the deck, or, or what have you. Um, and again, it, it's great because what we're seeing is, you know, one, lots more folks are participating in that. It's not, uh, it's not compulsory. Mm -hmm. I mean, I expect folks <laughs> to participate in it. We see a lot of adoption there, but it's done on their own time um, when they're in the right frame of mind. And because the tools are so great in collecting the content together, for the person that's getting the feedback, you know, they also, it's, it's all aggregated together. They can parse through the feedback. Think, um, and because the tools are getting so easy, um, you will have new ideas. Like, hey, I really appreciate, you know, your solution here. Have you thought about this? And so um, that's become a really effective method for, for our team to kind of get more of the, the, um, all the participants on the mm -hmm. team to start contributing. Yeah, and it sounds like you're really meeting people where they're at. Uh, Trying to, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's sure. awesome. Um, one of the things that you know, our teams have both scaled uh, pretty rapidly, and a lot of scaling means people coming in and adding to your culture and kind of, you know, becoming part of the team and contributing their own their own like unique background and experience to the team. And at the same time, you need to to help them realize uh, what it's like to work on your you know at your company to be part of this environment to be contributing towards it. And so I'm curious, kind of. How have you ensured, as, as you've been hiring so many people, that you've onboarded them well and that they've had a fantastic experience with that and that they're working in a way that's effective for, for everyone? Yeah, I mean, you know, prior to the pandemic, we always had a fairly, I was proud of our onboarding process. We started with a boot camp a couple days where, you know, new employees get to meet leaders of, of different parts of the business. Get, get the story and understand the values and all that, and that's great. And we've transitioned that to uh, uh, digitally. Um, but what I think we've found is that, one, that's a lot of information all at once. You're a new, new employee, that, that's really tough. So we've really doubled down on our documentation. And it's not just about, like, here's the strategy documents to read, but it's about things like team norms. Mm -hmm. You know, hey, it's okay to do this kind of stuff. We don't expect you to do this um, and getting really just kind of explicit. Some of the stuff that you take for granted. Um, the other piece is we were constantly asking our new employees what could have gone better. I had a discussion uh, just two days ago. One of my designers just hit his uh, 90 day and we're like, hey, you know, that was great, um, but please give us feedback on what, what the onboarding process was like. And he's like, you know, I love it, you guys set up a list of meet and greets, right? You talk about how important building relationships are and how that can be intimidating. So I got this list of like, hey, talk to this person and talk to this person, and, and that was wonderful. But he's like, you need to realize that as a new employee, it's intimidating to put something on a stranger's calendar. And I'm like, well, you know, you know, we, you know now we have a culture that it's okay to like, you can put time on the CEO's mm -hmm. uh, uh, a calendar. But he didn't know that when he first started. And so it really makes me think of like, okay, well, do we reverse that? Uh, or how do, we, how do we think about this? And getting back to the experimentation kind of mindset, it's um, constantly looking at how you can do better and actively soliciting for feedback to see how you can improve. Um, I've seen some actually really cool mural templates that are kind of around this. I'm really curious what you guys do. Yeah, we, we, uh, we invest quite a bit in, in our onboarding experience. We have a program called Liftoff, and you know everybody gets familiar with the leaders of the company, mm -hmm. very similar to that. But we also try to invest in team-level onboarding, because it's one thing to like, know what the company is and the mission. A lot of people join for that reason, and so mm -hmm. they're usually pretty familiar with it. But 
who are the people you're working with and how do they like to operate and what are the team's norms? And you know, we focus, um, I've been hearing also a lot in this conference about autonomy and alignment and we focus heavily on those things, which means there's some differences in teams, you know, team to team to team. And so part of what we try to do is have teams really share what their culture is you know, it's part of the company culture, but there's uniquenesses to, to certain teams. And so we've done things like, um, you know, very customized onboarding templates that a team has that says, okay, we're the design systems team, and here's where all our stuff is, and here's how we operate, and here's our, you know, team norms and all of that stuff. But also at a, at a person to person level, and so we have templates for like personal user manuals. If you've seen those before, it's like, this is who I am. And the, here's my like rough edges. I'm sorry, I'm working on those rough edges. And uh, here's how I like to communicate. Here's the hours I work. Here's some unique fun stuff about me. And really a lot of that for the, it, it is to help people feel like there's a guided experience for them, but also feel like they're part of the team and that they start to know each other and build those bonds together. Cause We've also really found over the years that those bonds and those relationships that you build, that's what sustains you as a, as a company. And again, like I'm hearing a lot of themes um, from you and we invest a lot too in like being very deliberate and intentional about what you do and how you work and how you communicate and what your culture is. And I, and I think if you, if you really are deliberate like that, it is infectious. One of the things that I've noticed probably over the past year that has kind of just emerged, one, we recognize that Especially with a growing company, you guarantee that in any meeting, somebody in there is a new employee. And it just becomes, it's becoming start of top of mind. So for instance, simple little things. You know, if I'm going to be talking, who am I? You know, I, easy for me to make the assumption that like, oh yeah, that guy, you know, that's head of design. No, I'm Jason and I run the design team. Now let's talk about this. The other thing is, and I'm sure this is true in every one of uh, your, your companies, Acronyms, mm -hmm. jargon, right? And it's great, you know, we have a Confluence page that's all built up, but in, uh, in real time, what I'm noticing is one, we're trying to avoid it, right? Let's actually like explain what we're talking about. But uh, what I love is in the, in the Zoom chat now, you know, we all slip up, we're not perfect. So somebody uses an acronym or a code name or something like that. And almost immediately there's two or three people in the chat that are starting to de 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 define what that means. Mm -hmm. And it's this kind of mindset of recognizing that, look, we've brought these amazing folks into the company. Now how quickly can we get them oriented so they can start participating in the mm -hmm. conversation? And again, like I think that's infectious, that, that mindfulness of understanding that like, Really, if we want this equitable environment, we've got to reduce some of those barriers. Yeah, totally. And it's like, I mean, ultimately, the value to me in a lot of this is that participation, right? Like, that's the value that diversity brings to your team. That's the value that you can get, like, irrespective of just we're all humans and it's nice to feel like you belong and you're included in things. Just like as businesses achieving outcomes, getting people to like getting the best of, out of everybody in a room and having them feel like, you know what, like I matter here, I can have an impact here, I can do things that are great and that I'm supported by my team. Mm -hmm. Like it just amazing things happen that you can never anticipate happening with, without that. So without a doubt. Yeah. Cool. So uh, I, I'm kind of curious, so we both have products that are in many ways about collaboration and about getting input and about all of these kinds of things. So how do you approach uh, this topic with respect to the product you build? Yeah, I mean, I think we've talked a lot about how important it is to, to have not only just a diverse team, but also having a, a, a level playing field and mm -hmm. folks can have a voice into the product development. But um, the other piece is, think about your users, right, your customers, and ensuring that you're getting uh, a diverse perspective mm -hmm. from your customers as you're building your products or your services or your brand or, or whatever it is. And um, I think, you know, we'll, we'll have a leave behind later. It doesn't have to be that hard. You know, as we think about like, hey, as we're trying to understand or discover something new, what are the questions that you should be asking your customers and getting that feedback? And it's not just from, okay, let's go talk to our primary uh, audience. It's thinking about your, your secondary personas, your tertiary personas, and really as you look at who you're talking to, having that kind of mindfulness of like, does this really represent the broad set of customers that, um, 
that we, that we intend. And by getting that feedback throughout the development process, not just at the end where you want to know if it's usable or not, early when you've got the initial ideas, because you'll be amazed at the insights that your customers are going to give you, right? Uh, an, ad, an advertisement, you know, simply being able to show folks, hey, how does this resonate? Oh, I love it. But what's better is, oh my gosh, that's offensive to me in my culture. Mm -hmm. Like that is absolute gold and it doesn't have to be that hard. And getting that feedback early in the process mm -hmm. is much easier to address than once you've got something developed or, or launched and now you're in, a, in kind of a, a fix it after. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, you kind of touched on um, accessibility earlier. Mm -hmm. I know we've invested a bunch in there. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about what you're doing? Because this is really interesting because you have a visual collaboration experience, yeah. which I can imagine introduces all sorts of crazy challenges. Yeah, it, it's, there's innovation needed there uh, for, for sure. And we are working on that. Um, when it, you know, we take accessibility very seriously. We have a whole team dedicated to it. Um, we have a pledge that people can sign that, that's like, I'm going to back this. And in my work, I'm going to build accessibility into the, the area of the product that we're working on. As well as we, we've done an audit, we know where all of our issues are, and we're systematically working on them one by one. Um, but yeah, we have a challenging product to, to make really accessible. And at the same time, it's that kind of product. Like when we're talking about collaboration, everybody needs to be part of that, right? Like it, it's not just for the sighted. It's not just for um, the people who think visually or think whatever. Like it's for everybody. We want every voice to be heard. And so we do a lot of work and like each of our teams is responsible for making sure that they're building accessible products. And we kind of tackle it um, on the whole. We have a pledge that's publicly ex um, available out there. And we, we work with external people to do assessments and then we're just working on them one by one by one. And, you know, it's valuable for those customers, but what we've also learned through this experience is the work that you do to make a product accessible makes it better for everybody else, right? It, it's really intentionally thinking about the experience. It's universal product. design. Right? Yes, 100%. And I know you can appreciate that with your background. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I, you know, we've done similar investments in it. I would say we're, we're it's, it's a journey, mm -hmm. right? And last year, particularly, was a lot about educating ourselves around this. And one of the mm -hmm. novel things that we did that um, I would recommend everyone is we, we created empathy labs. And what this is was workshops for everybody on the product team to actually experience what it's like to try and use our product or other products with uh, visibility issues, with mm -hmm. mobility issues, trying to, uh, or, or being deaf. Mm -hmm. And um, what we saw is the, the transition from knowing it's the right thing to feeling that it's the right thing to do. And that has really led to kind of more of a movement mm -hmm. in ensuring that um, not at the end of the process, but mm -hmm. at the beginning of the process, when we're talking about, hey, let's invest in this feature or this kind mm -hmm. of capability, it's having the conversation then, oh, well, what does this mean for somebody who can't see? Mm -hmm. How would we address that? And mm -hmm. it makes it so much easier to accommodate that early mm -hmm. rather than at the end, and we're in the same boat, right? Mm -hmm. we've, we, do, we audit our experience and we've got a list of like, oh, we've got to go fix this and this, and, and that's super important. But moving forward, how do we do so in a way that we're not adding to that kind of experience mm -hmm. debt uh, for those that have special needs? Yeah. A hundred percent. I think doing these things from the beginning, wh whether it's related to accessibility, using a product maybe like user testing that lets you go ask customers what they think about what you're building, it is always better to do it the, at the beginning, we found too, because then you can build it the right way. It's a lot less costly and you can serve the world a lot better um, in that way. Um, I'm, I'm curious, uh, you know, as you're approaching this with your teams, we have people again in, in this room and watching that, that are really wanting to take on some of these challenges themselves. So what are some pitfalls people should be thinking about that might uh, impact their ability to, to do so? I, I mean, I don't know about pitfalls. I, I, I think I'm, what I'm hoping that you take away from this is there's, uh, there's an intentionality to it, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, that, that's number one. Number two is having a, uh, an experimental mindset. Mm -hmm. It's okay to fail. Some of the things that we've learned, like for instance, we're like, oh, this is great, right? Like we can record the meetings mm -hmm. and we'll still kind of have this kind of uh, synchronous mentality. 
and then we'll share the meeting afterwards. The reality is, is that folks have busy days. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, to have a stack of recorded meetings, that's not equitable. They're not getting the same information. It's not fair. And so because of that experimental mm -hmm. uh, uh, attitude, we're like, well, let's try this. And then it doesn't work. Okay, discard it. Mm -hmm. Move on. And if some of you have figured out how to do that and make it work, that's awesome. I'd love to hear about that. Mm -hmm. But for us, it just wasn't really effective. And so then we go back and we iterate again. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I feel we have like an unfair advantage as designers because we, we use this methodology called design thinking, mm -hmm. right? Like ideate and then explore and like fail fast. And mm -hmm. um, we're in this kind of iterative process. And so we do that, we apply that same kind of methodology mm -hmm. to any problem. You know, any challenge that we have. And so, um, you know, some might argue, okay, like if we are including more folks, it's gonna slow us down, you know, or it's gonna lead to groupthink. I kind of call bullshit, you know, like uh, the opportunity to get feedback. You still have the same mechanisms of uh, dealing with the data. There can be a lot of different uh, perspectives, but at the end of the day, you still have to, you still have to make the decision. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't think that it's, it's something that should uh, stop us because mm -hmm. the rewards, the value of getting um, all these voices and uh, different perspectives into the way that we work, it's worth it, mm -hmm. right? Even if it does maybe slow you down a little bit or it makes it a little bit more inconvenient. So, you know, I've heard those kind of resistance to it, but um, I think the, the end, it, it, it's just worth it. Well, and, and there's speed and there's false speed, I, I think, too. It might slow you down, but you're building things that work for more people and get more voices to be heard and, like, better serve your customers, get more customers, drive better outcomes, all those kinds of things. So, yeah, you could say in that moment it slows you down, but does it actually have a negative effect? No, it has a hugely positive effect totally. um, for you and your business. And you mentioned design thinking, just a little plug. We just announced our Collaboration Design Institute as part of our collaborative intelligence uh, la uh, launch that we've had in the last few weeks. So check that out because I think as you're thinking design thinking, you know, Jason just said, you know, we as designers have this advantage, but everybody can use those methods, no matter um, what industry in you're in, no matter what team you're on, what kind of problems you're trying to solve. It's universal problem it is, solving yeah. techniques. And what I really like about that is you're thinking about the problem that you're trying to solve, and then you're collaborating with a big group of people on how you're gonna like set about solving that. And again, kind of coming back to this, you're getting every voice heard, you're getting every bit of input that you can into that process which means you're building better products, you're doing better work, your people are feeling better about being part of a team and all of those things. Totally, yeah. Cool, so I don't know if you have anything else to add or we should open uh, up for some questions. You know, I, I think probably some folks, if they haven't already started exploring this, might have the question of, well, how do we get started? Yeah. I don't know, what do you think? Just start, first of all. Like, that's, one, <laughs> that's one thing I would say. Uh, ha have some conversations with your team. Talk to your team. Um, talk to everybody on your team, right? Um, and I, I think talk to, like, I would, this conversation, right? Like, involve, seek out people who care about this stuff and want to talk, talk about it. Yeah, I, I agree. I think um, it was interesting when we first hit the pandemic um, and we were, like, going fully remote. Mm -hmm. I immediately reached out to Mural actually and other the, uh, folks that like, the, I knew that they embodied and they lived this for, for best practices. So having that conversation mm -hmm. um, is, just, is, is just critical and, and networking and, and iterating and ideating. Um, I, I like what you say, the, um, have the conversation. Have a purposeful conversation. Get together with your teams. Talk about what type of working environment you guys envision. Right, what, does, what are we good at mm -hmm. and where are we failing? Where are some of the challenges? Mm -hmm. And then um, ideating mm -hmm. around, you're gonna come up with a huge list of things. This really sucks or this is really challenging or we're not hearing enough of this voice. Pick a couple things, mm -hmm. just, just cherry pick and go and mm -hmm. see what you can ideate around, try it. You're gonna fail, you know, you're gonna try things that don't work, that's okay. Move on to the next thing. So I really think it's about um, getting that, that kind of ball rolling. Yeah, it's a cultural thing, right? Yeah. Like more than anything. And I think part of the positive 
impact that that has on your culture is that ju people just knowing that you care about it on your team and that you're going to invest in it and that you're listening and that you're going to try things and that you admit that it's actually a success if you try it and it doesn't work because you learn from it and then you can go try something else. Like it creates a culture where people feel like they want to contribute more broadly to the culture of your and, company. And the coolest things that we've done and the things that we've learned have come from those voices that we might have never expected it. Right. You know, the, the quiet writer who's been listening the whole time, she's mm -hmm. like, well, what if we try this? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, you know, like, uh, so it really kind of builds on itself. And, mm -hmm. I, and I think that mindfulness and that intentionality to it is, is, is critical. All right, thanks, Jason, Kirby, appreciate hey. it. Thank you very much. Yeah.